All right, good morning. It's a uh, man brand new day, middle of the week. Uh, so if you're one of those, you know, Monday through Friday kind of guys and gals, then uh, you're almost home, all right, halfway. We're on the downhill slope, right? And so, uh, man, hope you had a, a great uh, first part of the week. Hope things are going well for you. Um, not sure what all, you know, if you got issues, need some help with anything, uh, you know, that I can help with, I'd love to pray for you. So you can drop those either direct message me or you can, uh, you know, just drop them in here. But uh, I just want you to know, I appreciate you and I care about you. Um, and so enjoying uh, really just everybody and what's going on and um, how many people are just kind of tuning in and, and um, taking, just watching and, and learning with us as we go through the book of Acts. And so it's been rich. Uh, this has probably been, for me, one of the uh, best studies I've done in a while from a from a reset perspective, it's been good. I've taught through so much of the scriptures in the past, uh, you know, 40 years of doing ministry. Never really uh, taken the time to go through the book of Acts like this. We've hit highlights of it in ministry, mostly in leadership and things like that. But uh, to just walk with you guys through this has been um, extremely outening uh, in enlarging my vision. And I'm, I'm just really excited about about where God has me, and a lot of it is because of just studying the Word of God. And and just to remind you, I mean, I appreciate those of you who drip in here occasionally and watch and, and all of that, and those of you who are just diligently here. Uh, I would just encourage all of us, daily time in the Word, not out of duty, but just to uh, reframe your thought process is powerful. And so uh, I would just encourage you to do that. Whether you tune in here or you uh, just get in your own reading program and you do it or you, you grab a, a book and, and work through it that's leading you a commentary on the scriptures, it's just essential for, for our lives. Um, and I, I think, I think it, the times call for that. So uh, anyway, that's my little word of encouragement for you. Hope everything's going well in your world. We're going to jump into the book of Acts Chapter 20, we're going to close out Paul's uh, last meeting with the elders at Ephesus. And so it's a it's a rich, good time uh, that we're going to look at. And so uh, let's get to it and see where it was. Um, verse 25 is where he kind of begins to get into the meat of things. And we, we looked at this yesterday. So today, really, all I want to do is kind of read this section to give us a running start. And we're going to go from 32 uh, down and finish the chapter out. So uh, just, in, just so you know, Paul had, had invested a great amount of time in Ephesus. Uh, it's, a, it's a city in um, Turkey, Asia Minor, kind of sits in the southwest area of that and then dotted up and around throughout the region are all of the other six letter or six uh, churches uh, in the book of the Revelation that's mentioned there. And so the scripture says that from that vantage point, from Ephesus, all of Asia heard the word of the Lord. How did they hear that? Well, Paul was concentrated there for three years. The, the most time he spent really in any one place uh, that we know of was there. Now, he may have spent that much time in Antioch, uh, which is his home church, uh, so he may have, he, that was where he, uh, he was called by the, pulled out by the Holy Spirit. He and Barnabas for the work that God had called him to do. And so, uh, so when Paul gets saved, he begins to be discipled. And, uh, so, and he finds a lot of that up in Antioch. And so that's where he spent time. And then he's launched out into his ministry. And so we've journeyed with him on that. This is the last leg of his missionary journey at three of those uh, the next trip he will take will be one heading to Rome to trial. And uh, so we'll, that's what the last uh, few chapters of, of the book of Acts is about. Uh, but but so, so Paul landed in Ephesus, stayed there, and uh, well, visited once and then came back, stayed there, and had some great help there. Uh, that's a church where John the Beloved, uh, that wrote the book of the Revelation, he pastored there for a season Timothy pastored there uh, for a season. Paul pastored there for a season. They had some heavy hitters uh, that were leading the church there. So how did it get started? Well, Paul began to uh, to teach at the Hall of Tyrannus. Uh, he would do that daily. He would teach in the Hall of Tyrannus. <laughs> then, at, then at house to house at night, he would just have his, his small group. Maybe it was different ones. 
whether he was teaching the same thing from house to house or however that worked, but he taught in that three-year span the whole counsel of God. Everything that he thought was profitable to them, he taught. Powerful when you think about uh, just how you go into a landscape and there's no gospel witness, and then there's a great gospel witness that's going on. And so uh, pretty exciting to see what developed. So, uh, so he has... He has pastored there. He has left. He had made, made a loop to visit some other places in, in Greece, Europe rather, to uh, gather money to take back to the church in Jerusalem. And so he's done that. He's now sailed to Miletus, which is about 50 miles south of Ephesus uh, in the Middle East. And uh, they come to him. He says, hey, I want, I want the elders to come down and, and hang out. I want to spend some time with them. So he spends an evening with them there. We assume it's probably that. Um chatting with him. And so we're peering in on that intimate conversation that that Paul, who had spent three years with his people uh, and had seen men risen up in leadership, they're with him now. So this is a leadership council in a sense. These are the movers and shakers of the kingdom of God in Ephesus that have come down and Paul wants to give them some final instruction. So that's where we find ourselves. I hope that helped give you a little recap. He says, now, and now I know that none of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will see me again. He's like, look, man, I, I, this is the end of it for us. I'm, I'm heading to Jerusalem. Spirit says prisons and, and afflictions await me. I'm not anticipating being able to see you again. There's some sobering things that take place in the reality that this world is fleeting and that these encounters that you and I have, most of our life is seasonal, right? Uh, you know, we we just go through seasons. Some people have lived in the same town their whole life. I've done that, uh, moved around within the town, but for the most part, lived in, the t in Birmingham my whole life. Uh, but still, there's seasonal ministry. There's there's people that I, I am probably never going to see again, right? My travels in different areas. There were some people in Belize, and there's some people in Romania and India and all of those. We still connect, but but I've not seen them in, in, in quite a while, and, and I may never. Uh, and so there's just the reality of how important it is to live in the moment, right? When you're with people, let's just be Christ to people. Let's, let's do that. Now, so he says... And now I know that none of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, in light of that, I declare to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you, because I did not avoid declaring to you the whole plan of God. I told you all about the kingdom of God from beginning to end and everything that's going to happen in the middle. Be on your guard uh, for yourselves and for all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers. You guys are the ones who are in charge of that flock of people in Ephesus, the, sh the sheep, so to speak, that have gathered God's chosen people. You are responsible to keep them safe. And he says, so you guard them. Uh, and and uh, you're an overseer to shepherd the church of God, pastor those people, lead them, feed them, uh, Keep the wolves out, right? This is this is the whole point. We looked at that yesterday. Um, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. That's not your church. It's his church. He purchased it with his blood. You are an under-shepherd in that area. Do it well, he says. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Man, when I leave, listen. Uh, I mean, he's not tooting his own horn saying, hey, look, man, I'm a great shepherd. He just he was intentional about about truth and keeping uh, truth pure and unadulterated and not allowing people to to make it say things it doesn't say. He says, I know when I leave, they're going to think, hey, man, it's fair game now and they're going to start pouncing on you. You need to be ready. And so he says, then, therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for three years, I never stopped warning each one of you with tears. He said, not only did I do it collectively, but I did it with each one of you. There's some power in that ministry of understanding that Paul, man, he was he was one on one. Right. I mean, he spent time one on one in small groups, in large groups. He was doing it all. That's in great contrast, really, to the mega church pastors these days and all these guys that fancy themselves as as. Um, too important to spend time in the one-on-ones and and to, to, to do the work to get down into the, 
the, the, the nitty gritty, so to speak. Uh, you know, there's, there's so many guys that, you know, they don't even see anybody on Sunday, man. They stay way back. They walk out on stage, do their thing, and then they leave. And no one gets to speak with them. Um, that's a foreign concept in the kingdom of, of, of God. And um, I, I'm not bashing that. I'm just saying it's something that, that is there. Uh, but, but a true shepherd, man, he, he's gonna, he can't help but, but shepherd. He's going to shepherd one. He's going to shepherd 10. He's going to sh- shepherd 1,000. He's going to shepherd 10,000, right? He's just going to do that. Now, uh, he says, and now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace. Now, we're gonna, I want to break that down in just a second. But I just, as I'm looking through this, knowing that we're in Ephesus and we're talking to the leaders uh, you, you naturally want to drift to First Timothy, or I do, First and Second Timothy, because Paul wrote the letter to Timothy while Timothy is pastoring the church at Ephesus, and Timothy is whom he leaves there kind of in charge. Uh, there, uh, he, he's a little, he feels young, he feels inadequate, and so Paul's always bolstering him up. But he, we give great insight into what Paul thought about as it relates to leadership, which are these men that he's talking to now. And there's a passage that um, has has really haunted me in a good way over the course of my ministry is 1 Timothy 4.16. He says, watch your life. He tells Timothy, Timothy, watch your life and watch your doctrine closely. For by it, by your conduct and your truth, you save not only yourself, but your hearers also. And so uh, I, I'm mindful of that. I, I need to watch my my life, what I do, right? Because people, man, if there's ever been a time where where you the pastors are under a microscope, it's right now. And so many of them we've seen recently uh, have been uh, caught in in a lifestyle that that is inconsistent with the kingdom of God, and they're prominent. Now, listen, and every pastor struggles with so many things. I, I mean, I it, and there are certain seasons in my life you can look at me and go, "Man, that dis- that man's disqualified. He does not meet the qualification." Um, and and so I'm grateful that it's the body of our life that God looks at, not the minutia of the one thing. Right? Is with David the one thing that didn't keep him from saying. David's a man after my own heart that didn't keep him from saying, I'm going to bless this generation and this generation and this generation because of my servant, David. And so it's important that we don't just, when a man has a flaw, we just toss him away. Uh, But at the same time, there is a mandate that all of us should have, that we should watch our life and our doctrine closely. Listen, your kids see everything you do. Your grandkids see everything you do. I was mindful of that this weekend while we were at the beach of just knowing that that what I said or how I acted or what I did, my grandkids pick up on that. I'm an influential grandfather to 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 a lot of my grandkids and and so I I want them to see, if 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 they're looking at my life, I don't want them to see stuff that's inconsistent with what the scriptures teach. And I would encourage you to do the same thing. That's why that's why this is so haunting in that many ways. Watch your life and your doctrine closely. You have to watch how you live your life and you have to you have to to watch what you allow to you, your thoughts, right? The the truth. Watch your life and your doctrine, what you believe, your teaching. That's what doctrine is. It's teaching. That's why I, you know I, so for me doctrine is reduced down to that God is sovereign, God is good, and God is loving, right? And so I know that, and I know I, I know the scriptures. I, I, I want to watch my teaching. I don't want it to de- deviate, because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So it's important that we're good students of the Word of God. And and so it's just important that we do that. There's, there's a void of great shepherds uh, in the church today. There's a lot of showmen, and I don't mean that in necessarily a, a worldly, arrogant way. There's just a lot of show. There's a lot of emphasis on what happens in that one hour or 45 minutes or whatever the teaching is on a Sunday morning. And as important as that is, it is the shepherding. It is it is the beating back the wolves. It is encouraging the, the tender uh, sheep to be strong in the faith. Uh, and and time pass, it, time is over of the little ditties of devotionalism and it all being about a pastor. Uh, it's time to watch what people are learning, if, and and that's a good word for those of us who have kids in school. Uh, you know, you should be very aware of what's being taught in your schools. Uh, though you, you're you're entrusting your kids 
uh, at, at tender ages over to people, and you don't know what they believe. I, I don't know how anybody puts their kids in some of the uh, government schools that they do these days, uh, but but you still bear that responsibility to watch your kids, to watch your life and your doctrine, and watch your kids' lives and their doctrine, right? Why? For by it, I don't save just myself, but my hearers also, everybody around me. I don't live in a vacuum. It's the butterfly effect. What I do will affect what happens in other people's lives. And it's important that we see that. Tammy, I've been watching American Idol, and you can see it uh, in there as they begin to tell the stories. You can see everybody's got a painful past. Everybody is about that far from cracking up. And a lot of it is because someone hasn't rightly taught some of these people or they abandoned them. One of the little girls last night was talking about when their mom and dad got a divorce, how it kind of wrecked the family and it sent her in a dark place, right? We, we don't understand that the things that we do as couples has a long-term effect on our kid's life. Now, I didn't mean to deviate that long in that. I just think it's important that we that we see that. There's an abundance of wolves out there today. Some of them are in the pulpits, and we should be aware of that. So now, let's get to this. He says in verse 32, And now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace. So that word commits, an interesting word. It means to entrust you to God. So what he's saying basically is here's a prayer. Hey, man. I've done all I can do for you I, 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 here physically. I'm now entrusting you uh, to God and to his word, the word of his grace. Uh, I'm placing you in the care of, paratithemi, that's the word there, to to put b- put beside God. Like, I'm okay, I'm, I'm laying you there now before God. That's not to say that he hadn't before. He's just saying, I physically will not be here anymore. I, I, he's make, This is a release for him. He's like, I'm entrusting that God will, will will care for you and he will meet your needs. If you've ever sent a kid off to college, you know what that feels like. If you've ever sent your kid somewhere and you're not there, off to camp or whatever else, there's that feeling of saying, all right, I'm not, I can't be there. So I'm I'm entrusting them to, to God. I'm, I'm we did that, you know, with, with Abby when she went to Liberty with 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 our boys when they when one went to Liberty and then they went to Bama. Uh, we, we did that with all of them. There's a place where you go, okay, well, I can't be there all the time. I'm entrusting Abby to God and to the word of his grace to survive college, right? And not be influenced in ways that she shouldn't. So he committed them to God. That's an important thing in leadership that, that the, the church is, doesn't belong to me. We, we entrust them to God. If, if God calls me to, to step away from where I am now and move to somewhere else, there is going to have to be, again, that entrusting. Like, all right, I'm, I'm just having to trust that the Lord's going to do his thing in your life. And, and so it's important there's that handoff. And Paul is saying, hey, I've done everything I can, so I feel good about that. Then he says this, uh, and and the word of his grace, right? I mean, I committed to the word, man. I've taught you the word day and night, so there it is. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for three years, I never stop warning each of you with tears. Just keep remembering what I say. How many times have we done with our kids? Hey, remember, remember kids, this is who we are. Remember kids, this is who you are. Remember, 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 right? This is what Paul was doing daily. And so he's now like, look, man, I, our time together, it's you now. I'm, 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 you need to have your walk and commit to your way to the Lord because I'm, I'm laid you at his feet and you need to be remindful and mindful and make the truth your own. The grace, the, the, the grace of his truth, you need to embrace for yourself. And this is what he's saying here. And then he reminds them, and this is where the, the length of this is, which is just a quick understanding that Paul's going, Hey man, uh, I, I'm, I, I, I didn't. I didn't do any of this for gain. There's. Not, I didn't get any benefit, you know, worldliness from this. He says this, um, which oh, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all the sanctified. Man, it's God in the Word that's going to build you up. Then he says this: You yourselves know that I worked with my own hands to support myself. I didn't covet any man's silver or gold or clothing. Listen, I wasn't out. I wasn't trying to out, get out this for, for money. In every way, I've shown you that it's necessary to help the weak. Now, it doesn't mean physically weak. He means spiritually weak. Those who, who are prone to go, I think he's just doing that for money. He said, he said listen, those who, who didn't understand that I have the right to take money, though I did not, I did it for that reason. It was necessary to help the weak laboring like this and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus because he said it is more blessed to give 
and then to receive. Now, you'll never find that in the Gospels. That's, that, that's what I love about the gospel. Remember when John said, I suppose if we were to write everything down that he said and did, the whole world wouldn't contain the library? Paul just gave an example of that. Nowhere in the gospels do you see where he specifically said those words. It's not like, oh, it's quoted, Mark quoted that. Nope. This is unique to Paul. It is more blessed to give than to receive. But it must have been a statement that he made consistently uh, throughout the scriptures, I mean, throughout his, his life on the earth. And so this is Paul's mindset. It's more blessed to give than to receive. And he said this, he knelt down and prayed with all of them. There were many tears shed by everyone. They embraced Paul and kissed him, grieving most of all over his statement that they would never see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. So that's how we end this, man. Ministry is giving, not receiving. And that's all Paul did. Um, and, and so it's a powerful reminder of how you and I should, should live our lives, right? So Lord bless you guys. Uh, man, we're going to, we're going to plot into verse, I mean, chapter 21 tomorrow and, and see what happens after that. Lord bless you and, uh, be strong today and Lord willing, I'll see you in the morning.